In an era of urbanization, the perspective of the local communities are often getting diluted. And so, through this panel discussion, landscapes of loss, livelihoods in peril, we attempt to mainstream those marginalized messages. The moderator for this segment, Ms. Mekha Gupta. Ms. Mekha Gupta has worked in Indian children's literature for over a decade and studied environmental humanities in UK. She heads the Young People's Program at GLF, curates a course on nature writing for young readers for the Asim Premji University, and is the author of a series of history books on independent India, including Unearthed and Environmental History of Independent India. It is such a delight to have Miss Mega moderating this specific session. And yes, with a great round of applause, may I hand the segment over to Miss Mega. The stage is all yours. So before I begin, I know we are sort of, uh, people are still streaming in from the post-lunch glory, but um, when uh, one thinks of loss in the context of the environment, uh, how many people here are thinking in terms of uh, biodiversity? Can I have a show of hands, please? When we think of loss in terms of the environment, how many people are thinking of biodiversity? All right. And uh, how many people are thinking of loss in terms of how it is experienced by uh, commu local communities? All right. So uh, the idea of conservation in my head, even though I am fairly intimidated by the collective experience of the panel, I am uh, getting to moderate here today. My understanding of conservation is that it is closely tied to our interpretation of what constitutes loss and to, uh, you know, when it comes to landscapes. And to uh, delve in the, into that a little bit more, I'd like to invite my panelists, uh, Aparajita Datta is a scientist at the Nature Conservation Foundation. Her conservation work is focused on protecting hornbills and forest habitats through partnerships with communities and the government. She's an author and co-editor of At the Feet of Living Things, 25 years of wildlife research and conservation in India, which is on our general fiction and non-fiction shortlist this year. Have a round of applause for Aparajita, please. Okay. Our second speaker uh, was born in Masuri, Uttarakhand, and much of his writing, much of Stephen Alter's writing, is uh, focused on the Himalayan region. His books have won multiple awards, including the 2020 Banff Mountain Book Award. Among Stephen's uh, latest books is Bird Watching, a novel which is also on our general fiction and non-fiction shortlist this year. So a round of applause for Stephen, please. And uh, finally, our last speaker on this panel is uh, Ewan Aves. Is Ewan here? Yes. <laughs> you know, Ewan is a writer, naturalist, educator, and activist who has been documenting stories from communities living along the Coromandel Coast for several years. Intertitle, A Coast and Marsh Diary, is his highly anticipated debut book for adults that is due to release on 18 December this year. So that's our panel. And between them, uh, I don't know how many, uh, I think close to 30 years of experience or more. And I have mostly dealt in the children's space, so please bear with me. Uh, um, I'm going to actually uh, start off by asking all of our speakers to contextualize loss in, you know, in the context of the landscapes within which your work is set. Because what's really wonderful about our panel today is that all of these speakers bring with them massive experience of very different landscapes. You know, with Aparajita, it's the forest habitats in the Northeast, and with Stephen, it's the Himalayan region, and with Yuan, it's, you know, coastal areas. So if you could just uh, contextualize your idea of loss. So, you know, as a, as a young researcher or as, or as a wildlife biologist, I think what we would notice when we first went into, I mean, I first went into some of the landscapes where I work, 
um, in the Northeast is the, um, you know, it's like a kind of frontier area where you, as, a, as a researcher or a student, you notice the loss in terms of the degradation of the landscape. Um, but you also start, I mean, more in terms of trees and the forest or the wildlife, you know, the, but then for me at least, or, or for many other researchers, you start also noticing the connections for the people. You know, the loss of a lot of the connections that the indigenous communities have with the landscape, or the kind of loss they face because of exclusion, um, either due to cons conservation uh, policies, um, or because of other factors that have made them move across landscapes, you know. Um, and you see the poverty uh, in, in those landscapes, um, which comes also with environmental de degradation. Um, that's been my experience, because there's a lot of um, what we call illegal logging, hunting, and all these things, which if you view it only through the lens of um, wildlife conservation, I don't think you get an understanding of why it's happening, you know, and what are the drivers because people's livelihoods get affected by um, you know, multiple things in those landscapes. Um, many people were shifting cultivators before, but they stop cultivation either because the government is subsidizing monoculture cash crop, uh, because shifting cultivation is seen as bad. Whereas actually shifting cultivation is a very evolved form of cultivation which is suitable to the hilly terrain in these landscapes. You know? A lot of research has shown that it's actually better for biodiversity and for many other, um, you know, um, for soil conservation and many other uh, reasons. Uh, but you know, it's kind of seeped into the bureaucracy and people, decision makers, that shifting cultivation is bad. Um, yeah, so people face all kinds of loss, you know, and erosion of their um, understanding of these landscapes. Yeah, sorry, I, I spoke too much, maybe. <laughs> no, th thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, I've been puzzling over this ever since, uh, Mega, you sent me the title and the, the sort of brief on loss and landscapes. Um, in the context of the Himalaya, there, there are many different ways we would think of it. Obviously, we think of loss in terms of loss of biodiversity or loss of forest cover. Uh, but loss of landscapes in a broader context is certainly part of the Himalayan experience. Uh, the Tarai, for instance, uh, until the 19th and into the early 20th century, was some of the largest old growth forests in India. And we lost all of that during uh, the 20th century, so that all of that, not all of it, but virtually all of it, is now under cultivation. So you've lost a, an entire biome that was there, uh, and the grasses, the grasslands now, are essentially sugarcane fields. And so there is that sense of a loss of a landscape uh, in many other contexts. I mean, the, the big infrastructure projects that have happened in the Himalaya, um, I'm most familiar with the Tiri Dam, which is uh, just near my home in Missouri, uh, where the Bhagirathi uh, tributary of the Ganga was uh, dammed uh, starting from, I mean, the project really began in the 60s and ultimately was completed in the 90s, and there you lost an entire uh, section of the river. Uh, and for the people there, the villager, it wasn't just the people in the town of Tiri, but it was the villages upstream, uh, and not just the villages that were inundated, but villages on the periphery of the reservoir itself, where the water began to erode the hillsides, and they had suddenly found themselves on a precipice. Um, so for all of those people, there was a tremendous sense of loss of home uh, and a loss of that particular ecology that was there in the Bhagirathi Valley. Um, and, but for me, one of the other things that is very poignant and fascinating as a writer is the loss of indigenous knowledge but also indigenous narratives that are connected to those landscapes. In the Himalaya, if any of you have traveled there, every mountain pass, every rock, every confluence of the river has a story attached to it. And there's the mythological narratives, but there are also the folk tales, uh, folklore, 
uh, folk knowledge that's attached to those things. So when a dam is built, people are displaced, they lose their homes, uh, whole habitats are destroyed, but there's also the narratives that are lost. And those narratives contain a knowledge, an immediate knowledge uh, that the people who lived there have developed over time. And so when the confluence of the Bhilangana and the Bhagirathi was covered over, you suddenly, there was a blank on the map. And not just on the cartographic map, but also in a sense, the narrative of the Ganga was broken at that particular point. So loss happens on so many different levels. Um, and I wouldn't discount also just the, the personal loss that different people have experienced uh, in these different landscapes. Um, a couple of years ago, I worked on a project where we translated a set of poems from Tiri. Um, it was Dupti Tiri Ki Akri Kavatayan, the last poems of submerged Tiri. And these were poems that were written at the time when the dam was being built. And they expressed a nostalgia for the landscape, for the cultural traditions, and all of the other issues in the context of Tiri. And we worked on translating those into English. Many of them were in Hindi or Garwali. And you could feel the resonance of each individual's loss and the larger community's loss in reading uh, about this dam and what it meant and how it changed their lives and their landscape completely. So loss is on so many different levels. Um, I'm from Chennai. And um, if I might come to loss in a uh, different angle, uh, one thing we did, we work a lot with uh, a fisher community uh, on campaigns uh, for very many years. And just after COVID, one thing uh, my team and I were invited to do was to run an education program, which is meaningful for children of that community because uh, they'd taken a beating during COVID. And one challenge we sort of set for ourselves is can I look at their coastal landscape as a rich living learning space? And that led us to sort of, um, you know, survey about 200 kilometers of coast, you know, nearly almost village to village, um, speaking to people, finding names of species which are found there commonly, stories, all of that. And we found that the, the 30 year olds, they, they knew they did not know all of these things and so we had to find the elders and then we had a way of building a curriculum over you know one or two years and then running it we found that children's uh, drive to learn language whether english or tamil and also uh, you know other simple cognitive academic uh, potential sort of increased when there was that sense of connection and curiosity to their uh, lived space and perhaps that and that was that seemed to be there in the elders in the 60 70 year olds and w w what hit strongly at the time was a, a loss of possibility and language and with that a loss of imagination which uh, which follows erasure of landscape the coast especially is a is a sand river you know I I live on the east coast where it's largely sandy beaches and it's constantly moving. It's moving north, in fact. Uh, no, no, it's, it's moving south on the east coast. And when you actually block it off, and a lot of coastal landscape loss, community livelihood loss happens when uh, infrastructure juts into the ocean and this sand river is blocked on one side and the other side, nothing is replacing what is being blocked and therefore, sea eats in and eats in. And, and so we there's a whole chunk in, in, in North Chennai where uh, uh, th there are ports and harbors being built in the south, dozens of kilometers away, and then sea eats away almost anywhere between 18 to 40 meters of coast every year, especially you know in, in, a, in a very ravaging way during the monsoons. Um, th th that's the sort of idea of loss I'm grappling with. Yeah. So, you know, uh, on all of your books, I mean, I've had the pleasure of doing an advanced reading of UN's book. The idea of people, 
Yeah, people are very central to the narratives uh, in all of your work. Uh, but for the longest time, conservation in India viewed people as a problem. And uh, in the 1970s, to most people here who are probably more familiar with Project Tiger, which was one of the world's largest wildlife programs at the time, led to the relocation, led to a saving of tigers, but also led to the relocation of thousands of people. So there was this sort of all pervasive attitude and I sense that a sort of essential tension also in conservation is are people a problem or are they part of the solution and uh, you know the Nature Conservation Foundation was a pioneer in terms of uh, viewing landscapes in a more holistic way and not excluding people from the view of landscapes and uh, you know it has uh, over the years led to an evolution of the idea of what is conservation because earlier on when I asked the question how many people here view uh, you know loss in terms of biodiversity there a lot more hands went up and then when I asked about you know in terms of local experiences so Aparajita if you could briefly sort of take us through how this evolution of ideas happened and you know uh, the sort of role of the NCF in it uh, uh, briefly and then I'll I think, you know, when we, um, a lot of our training, when, you know, we started as master's students, um, I was a master's student in the Wildlife Institute of India, um, and, you know, we were always told about the wildlife perspective much more, and we also, you know, came out with the feeling that um, people are a problem, you know, protected areas are, of course, needed, to save wildlife, and I think it's only, um, so in our generation, there used to be people who would also question this, and we would have very um, intense debates amongst ourselves. I remember there was an essay written by Ram Guha. Uh, it's called the something, the ecologist, huh? the, no, 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 it's, um, it's called, it was a very polemical, uh, um, you know, essay where he was just taking the side of, you know, there was, you know, he was pitting people against each other, uh, certain scientists who had different worldviews, a Madhav Gadgil versus, a, you know, Dan Jansen or, a, you know, Ullas Karanth. And uh, he, um, and we were all like, what is he saying, you know, I mean, we, we, we questioned what he had written. But I think I started slowly, um, understanding the perspective of people after I started working in Arunachal. And um, I went to the Pocket Tiger Reserve to work on hornbills for my PhD. Um, and I started interacting with the indigenous community, the Nishi community there. I learned a lot of things from them. And my assistant has so much knowledge. Um, he taught me so much, you know. I mean, we call him assistant, but he's actually like my guide, you know. So. Um, so, I guess I got very fascinated with the local knowledge, their culture, and lots of things like that. And I started seeing how people live and what are the problems they face, right? I mean, that's a very simplistic idea still, but then um, there is this, I'm, I'm just going to have to take an example of a place where I was working for more than 10 years, which is called the Namdafa Tiger Reserve, which is like a test case for this whole debate about fortress conservation or PAs. I mean, all of India, there are many protected areas where there are villages inside still. And one of the stated policies in Project Tiger is basically trying to make areas inviolate. We call it inviolate of, you know, and uh, preserving the core uh, free of people. But at the same time, you know, when you have the buffer areas, you expect people outside to coexist with the tiger. When the tiger population increases, if your conservation thing is successful, you expect people outside to um, you know, coexist. But at the same time, in the core, you're trying to make it inviolate, right? So in Namdafa, there are, there are people who've moved into the tiger reserve because they lost a lot of their agricultural lands, which, uh, you know, uh, they live in a very remote area, which is near the Burma border. And I worked with that community for a long time. They were at loggerheads with the forest department. 
they were viewed as um, just, you know, destroyers of wildlife, hunters, um, you know, they are, they are called encroachers. Um, but, you know, they are the ones who know that forest very well. And they are the ones who need to be won over in some sense, but they are fighting for their land. They are fighting for their survival, you know. They, they do not have anything else. You know, they need that area to cultivate. They want small areas to cultivate. Now, the problem is that what I feel is that every area ha is a context-specific, um, needs a context-specific approach. You cannot, you know, there are many tiger reserves. There are quite a few places where people are there, and so is wildlife. You know, BRT is an example where uh, community rights have been given. FRA has been um, also implemented there. Tigers are there, people are there. I mean, that again sounds simplistic, but there might be contexts where there will be conflict with people, right? But the point is that in Namdafa, it's like a, the, the conflict is so much because people, you cannot force relocation on people who do not want to be relocated. They have tried for 25 years. And you know, it's very sad. At the end of it, it's all back in the same uh, situation. So we need to find other ways, you know, where you can figure out a more uh, creative solutions. You know, it's, it's very rigid thing to follow to say that all core areas have to be inviolate and we have to have all villages outside, you know, out of the tiger reserve. In some places, you'll have to allow some kind of, um, you know, uh, habitation, settlements of people. Th this is what I have come to believe after a long evolution. Because right now, the situation is one of constant conflict. At loggerheads with the forest department, the leases will burn down the camps of forest department, forest department will retaliate. There's a lot of this going on for many years. And we try to work with the community in different ways, um, uh, which I'm not getting into because that's not the purpose. But this was just a one story. But this is true in many, many tiger reserves. There are very few tiger reserves in India which are free of people or villages. And in all of these places, the goal of the department is often to try to convince people to move out. But in some places, people don't want to. We call it voluntary relocation, but it's not often voluntary, you know? And it's also a slow wearing down of people. If people say no once, again, you know, there's attempts. And you know, you have to, under, you have to implement the FRA, you have to get Gram Sabha consent, you have to do it in a very open, there are steps to all these, uh, you know. Um, and yes, of course, there are examples like in Rajaji or Wainad or some places where people have wanted to move out. And maybe that works. And it's not just about, so even where people have agreed, sometimes the relocation is not done in a manner which is suitable. There are very few examples of that. You know, people are often left destitute after they have moved out. The facilities provided to them, the skills that they have is not the same as where they're moved out to. They're given some marginal areas. Maybe hunter-gatherers are moved out to areas where they're expected to learn how to cultivate. You know, there's a lot of issues with this. And you need to look at it with, with, you know, with a better understanding of these communities and landscapes. You know, it's not like just about saving wildlife. I'm a wildlife biologist. I want wildlife to be saved. But you also have to look at how people are living. You know, um, they are not privileged like many of us, right? So they are, they are from those landscapes. They need the land, you know, for survival. Thank you. Uh, you know, so taking off from that, and because uh, Aprajita is the book that she's co-edited, um, speaks a lot about how people I mean, of course, wildlife animal conflict is very central to a lot of the stories in the anthology you've edited. But you know, also the idea of environmental movements, uh, sometimes when we look at them, the, it, the idea of environmental movements being a feature is quite naive in my imagination. I think environmental human uh, movements uh, historically have been you know, have emerged when uh, what one set of people think of as development ends up affecting the local and the, you know, livelihood of another set of people. 
and uh, the mountains, uh, uh, Stephen, have been, you know, sort of uh, at the helm of environmental movements in independent India. I mean, uh, Chipko movement in the 1970s and the Theri Dam protests and so many ecologists, I mean, so many environmentalists, uh, Sundarlal Bahugana, Chandi Prasad Bhatt, all emerged from the mountains. And yet what one finds is the barrage of bad news from the mountains is just unending. You know, uh, even now, I think in the newspaper, uh, there's a t road that is caved in, people that were trapped, and then dams, you know, rivers breaking the dam, and it's, it's just, and Joshi Mutt, it's just endless. What is it, you know, uh, what is it about, uh, you know, if uh, the hills that is leading to this ferment, and as, as a self-proclaimed endemic species of the mountain, if you could sort of just offer an insight on uh, what it means to communities who live in these conditions where, you know, they probably are always living in peril. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not an expert on this. Absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm speaking more as a layman and, and more from a personal experience, uh, not as a wildlife scientist. But um, I think what Aparajita has said is very true, that there are, it's not necessary in an either or situation. And there, there have to be come to the problem. There has to be consistent uh, working with those communities to uh, relocate them, to rehabilitate them, and to provide something meaningful for them in that way. So I, very definitely, I, I agree. It, you just don't sort of boot them out of the forest and then hope that they'll yeah, fend for themselves. Foot. In the mountains, um, yeah, the mountains are a landscape that, in a sense, has always had a tremendous amount of migration. Uh, there were people that would migrate uh, seasonally. There were people that were migrating because they were displaced from one area, whether it was through political conflict, whatever it might be, and they moved to another area. So the Himalayas, I don't think any community in the Himalaya, and I'd probably get into trouble for saying this, but no, no community that is resident in the Himalaya was there forever. They came from somewhere else. And if you listen to the stories, the... Uh, folklore, it all is stories of migration and movement in that way. So it's, I, I often say that people usually think of the Himalaya as this static, eternal landscape, yes. but in fact it's constantly changing. It's in flux uh, as we speak right now. And you have to understand it in that context that it's a living landscape and it's a landscape that is fragile. Uh, it is not eternal by any stretch of the imagination. And the communities there are also not fixed communities. They're, many of them are shepherds who move up to the higher pastures uh, during the summer and then move down. And that journey that they take is as important as the two endpoints along the way. And that whole landscape that they pass through when they're taking their animals up to the pasture, when the Van Gujars move up, they time it so that there is enough f for the animals to feed on. There's enough for the, the meadows. enough water. Uh, there are places to camp. All of those sorts of things are part of their calculation as they as they go up. Um, the last thing I just say about the mountains, which I don't think we should forget, and again, it's a controversial issue, is the militarization of the Himalaya. Yes. And that I think is an extremely difficult question for us to deal with, but the destruction caused by the militarization in places like Ladakh or Garhwal or Arunachal, Arunachal is, is critical to understanding the environmental issues associated with that place. And uh, you know, you when uh, taking off from that, you have written about how your work started off and you got involved in a campaign against a megaport, you know, forest landscapes assailed by the idea of protection and coastal landscapes assailed by the idea of privatization. Uh, and you know, you were involved in a campaign against a mega port, and that sort of set you off on your journey. And so maybe if you could take us a little bit through that personal experience, but I think we don't have a lot of time, but just, yeah, I, I would definitely like to hear that. And then one last question before we uh, maybe have one or two questions from the audience, yes. Got it. Um, so, so very quickly, um, the. 
a place of, uh, you know, a, a deep engagement from my side has been uh, Pulikad Lagoon, which is, uh, you know, India's second largest brackish water body. And there is a infamous industrial giant bil building their, uh, you know, 6,111 acre port just within 2.1 kilometers of the bird sanctuary, which is within its uh, eco-sensitive zone. Mm. Uh, which, which would actually erode a thin barrier island which makes the marine space a sheltered marine space and eroding which it would merge with the Bay of Bengal. So we've been, uh, we've been having uh, rather remarkable success uh, with that campaign. It's not over yet but a lot of it has uh, go gotten to do with uh, collaboration and coming together of all kinds of people local, non-local, semi-local, uh, self-proclaimed, uh, you know, endemics. And, uh, one part of this, uh, the other part has been very good sto documentation, storytelling, citizen science. Uh, E-bird checklists have helped far more than one can guess. Uh, interestingly, I'm not sure that's uh, there for, you know, other places. And um, uh, counter mapping of spaces to, to uh, refute what has been given in the EIAs uh, and, and things like that. And, and all of them coming down to uh, animating what is inanimate uh, in, in the minds of anywhere from the government to the public. Mm, which, uh, you know, Working there, it, it, it brought me to, you know, say something I love saying, which is, you know, barrenness is a state of mind, never a state of land. And uh, mm. having said that, you know, there are a lot of places I think, uh, you know, I, I'd like to see people as entangled and deeply part of the habitat. I think uh, Sahil Nijjawan wrote about how there are more tigers living happily in the community forest of the Bang Valley than in the, in the wildlife sanctuary. Then there is... a uh, Batsheba Dimoth in, in Floating Coast, uh, writing about how whales love to spend time where the Inupiats are living. There's, there's the Laps community in Norway. There's this Vedandangal in uh, Tamil Nadu where the lake was planted with Barringtonia because the droppings falling in the water used for irrigation makes yield better. And there's a, there's a trust, you know, you see a painted stock or an open build stock 10 kilometers away from there, they they fly away, you know, from, from far and then there in the sanctuary, they, they trust you and sit right there and, and that is sort of, there's a sort of interspecies culture brought and, 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 and a memory of that which is shared across, across beings. Um, that being on one side. There are other places where uh, the word, you know, local community, indigenous is sort of shaky and it's purely determined by, uh, you know, spectrums of power. Uh, one, we, we do a lot of legal work and one case I happened to be appellant of, although the team involved was much larger, was for an estuary called Kaliveli, where two very large uh, harbors were uh, being pr pushed there. And this uh, pushing of that was actually by the local community. Although a lot of other local communities there were against it, would not give their voice for it. These were turtle nesting grounds, there were places where more than 3,000 women were collecting oysters and lugworms. And we, we won that and also it, and there were some sort of backlashes also. But there are a lot of examples where there is a kind of inner capitalism growing, perhaps from external pressures too. And uh, I'm, the last thing I'm trying to say is it's important to see these concepts of local uh, endemic, non-endemic, all of that with a, with a strong heterogeneity, you know, from context to context, as you're saying, um, and, and, and not have these broad labels of how they will apply uh, across whole bioregions. So, last question then. One question for Stephen. Can I just... Uh, no, actually, yeah. I just wanted to ask, because I'm very curious, because, you know, this whole Sundarlal Bauguna, then Chandri Prasad Bhatt, and the environmental movement, how come all of that brought such a consciousness, but it do doesn't seem to have had an impact in the decision making of the bureaucracy in terms of the development of roads or dams or anything. You think it all overrides the culture, uh, like people there do not resist anymore or is it changed? Well, I, I wouldn't say it hasn't had any impact. Okay. I think that if you look at the Chipko movement, it, fundamentally it was 
fighting the forest department, giving contracts for felling trees, right. that stopped. Right. So that's not happening. Yeah, yeah. Sundar Lal Bahuguna sat at the Tiri Dam and I visited him several times there. Yeah. And it was this wonderful, I love lost causes, but it was this wonderful lost cause. And this mm -hmm. man sitting there in the face of this massive dam that was coming up. Now, he may have failed to stop the dam, <coughs> but there... <coughs> But I, th <clears throat> I think the Chipko narrative is still, still alive mm. to a certain degree. And I've heard bureaucrats voice it. But you're right in the sense that it, wasn't, it didn't solve everything right there. And it hasn't, a lot of people don't pay attention to it. But it's still there and I think it's still alive. Um, and you can see in the context of this tunnel that's been is now being excavated. I hope they're going to get out of there soon. Perhaps yeah. they already are. But in the context of that, all of those debates will come back. And Chandi Prashad Bhatt will be invoked. The women of uh, Rainey will be invoked. Uh, Sundarlal will also be invoked. So it, it's there. But it, it was not a final solution by any stretch. So I just have, I know we've completely out of time, but I actually have a last question, uh, if you can answer it as briefly as possible, but I'll uh, let you get a break. Uh, I'll come to you, Yuvan. You know, the common thread between all your writings is that they're very deeply personal. It's a very deep, it's very personal. It's, it's not a third person account. I feel like in a lot of the writings, you are very much part of the landscape. And uh, the difference there, though, is that you are not, in some ways, in the sense, you're not part of the community that is so entrenched in that landscape. Uh, so I wonder, you know, you have written a coast in Marsh Diary, and even your earlier book, A Naturalist's Journal, is very sort of coming from a personal perspective, but there's always that one thought when I read, and I wonder whether it strikes you. You ever wonder if somebody from the community was writing this, what difference uh, of perspective there might have been? If you can uh, dwell on that briefly. Um, see, I've had some very important teachers from, from the community yes. and, and who have sort of very openly acknowledged and, and, and write those uh, about. But then I, I don't want to guesswork on, okay, what will that perspective be? Uh, who's writing? And in, in my uh, head, you know, you know in a, in, a, in a fraught sense, I distinguish between uh, two things. One is, uh, you know, what the anthropologist Tim Ingold says, inhabitation and exhabitation. Is your identity uh, entangled with, with that of other things? Is the self sort of expanded into uh, the beings around uh, or not? Um, like, like Stephen was saying, uh, uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of movement with respect to who's been there for how long and, and to what extent. Um, things get blurry there, but we seem to have a very easy sense of saying who's local and who's not, uh, which, which, needs to be, uh, uh, which needs to be looked at in a sense, but in some places it's sure. clear. Um, and, and in some sense, there's only one authentic voice I can voice, which is my own. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that was a deliberate decision then yeah. too. Yeah. And, and, and on, on quickly on that note, uh, Aparajita, because you've co-edited this anthology and a lot of the really nice uh, sort of anecdotes from the field, but all by field researchers. So I was wondering if there is a problem with the own, own voices narrative, uh, if you could quickly dwell on that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's changing now. I mean, when it's true that it's my voice and I agree with his answer because we can only talk about how we, what we bring or what we feel in that landscape. But after having you know, interacted with a lot of the young people, now there are a lot of young people from those areas who are voicing their own thoughts, their own concerns. They are taking on leadership roles. It's really changed in Arunachal in the 25 years that I've worked. 
And it's very wonderful to see all, all people from different tribes in Arunachal who are also interested in nature, in their communities. They are going about it in different ways and with different perspectives from how I might have uh, you know, done it. And, uh, but at the same time, like he said, no, it's like, okay, I've worked in that place for 25, 30 years, but I'm from an urban city, I'm not from that area. But I think it's a allyship, it's also you're learning from each other. We should not always be pitting it against, you know, this outsider versus, you know, because I think everyone's, um, I, th I think it's not just about extracting, you know, from those communities, it's also about giving there. And they're also giving to you. So I think it's a reciprocal thing, it can be a good thing, you know, um, the learning, the exchange. And, and, and their voices are coming, you know, it's not just our, yeah. You know, there's this effort by Rita Banerjee, Green Hub, which has created a lot of a network of youth in the Northeast who are all sort of connected and who help each other. There are multiple efforts happening in uh, different places. Yeah, maybe in the next uh, festival, you'll have some of those people. <laughs> No, but uh, I'm going to have to actually close this panel. Uh, it's been really nice talking to all of you and thank you for your inputs. I'm afraid we are completely out of time for audience questions. Um, do we have time for maybe one or... No, I'm so sorry. Well, you're going to have to probably catch them uh, outside. I think all of them would be here. So you should probably have asked their questions, uh, asked them questions uh, personally. But thank you very much. Um, I have a small, uh, we have a small token of appreciation for all the speakers here today. Uh, I can have, and yes, can we have a huge round of applause for all the speakers for that penetrative uh, conversation that we had. token of appreciation from the Green Literature Festival family. Once again, expressing my heartfelt thanks to all the speakers.